Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Artificial Intelligence in Public Relations and Marketing. My name is Michelle Eisenberg, and I'm a program assistant at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit that is building a better path for entrepreneurs worldwide by improving inclusion, access, and knowledge in entrepreneurship. As you will see in the chat in a moment, the NASDAQ Center provides programs, resources, and exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So make sure to check out those links and resources in the chat. And then just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. First, let us know where you're dialing in from in the chat. And second, we're going to open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please make sure to submit your questions for us in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we'll definitely try our best to get to all of them. All right, Florida, Missouri, Chicago, DC, Ontario, San Antonio, New York, Indonesia, Hawaii, Mexico. Awesome. Thanks for dialing in, everyone. And of course, none of what we do could be possible at the center without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, Airbnb, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, Microsoft Entrepreneurship for Positive Impact, BPM, and HubSpot for Startups. We are truly humbled by their contributions and hope you are grateful too. And so before we get started, going to launch a few polls to step back and see how everyone's doing today. And we'll use this information to guide our future program development. So this first one's going to ask, how are you feeling? Launching fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic. Give everyone a few seconds to submit their answers. Awesome. All right, I'm going to end the poll share the results. Optimism is in the lead. Definitely have some feelings of survival and anxiety, so we'll try to address those today. I'm going to stop sharing and launch the second poll. What is keeping you up at night? This just tells us more about your current needs. Thank you. Thank you. Give you all a few more seconds. All right, gonna end the poll, share these results. Finance is in the lead, marketing close behind, but we really have a great smattering all, all around. So gonna stop sharing that. We'll keep that in mind for future programs. And without any further delay, please join me in giving warmest of welcomes to our special guest, Chris Ruby. Chris is an entrepreneurial leader in America's development of emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence and machine learning, and her investigative journalism work on Twitter's use of natural language processing, titled hashtag Ruby Files, was recently referenced by Elon Musk as worth a read. Chris is the CEO and founder of Ruby Media Group, an award-winning public relations and media relations agency in Westchester County, New York. She has more than 15 years of experience in the media and broadcast journalism industry. She's a media relations strategist, content marketer, and public relations consultant. Chris is also a national television commentator and political pundit and has appeared on national TV programs over 200 times covering big tech and the politics of social media and free speech. She graduated from Boston University's College of Communication with a major in public relations and is a founding member of the Young Entrepreneurs Council. Chris, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Going to hand it off to you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today with all of you. Um, I've just shared my screen. Are you able to see this okay? Looks great. 
Awesome. Okay. Um, well, thank you again for inviting me for the opportunity to speak today on the future of AI in PR and marketing. I've been working with the NASDAQ team on putting together this event for the past few months, ever since they reached out, and they have been a pleasure to work with. And I'm really excited about the topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, and what's what's also so interesting is just how um, the interest in this topic has even increased so much, even uh, from uh, a few months back and and how much the world has changed in just a short period of time from that initial conversation. Uh, so here is my bio that Michelle just read. So I, I won't go uh, through that too much. I will give you a little bit of a background on um, my company's work, Ruby Media Group, and, and our mission. So we work with founders, entrepreneurs, business owners, some in healthcare, SaaS, uh, and other verticals as well. Our, our vision and mission is to accelerate digital transformation, whether that is through social media marketing or now through deploying artificial intelligence and machine learning. We really help entrepreneurs harness the untapped power of emerging technology. And we do that through different services and content marketing, public relations, social media, SEO, and personal branding. And so today we are going to go through uh, different use cases uh, and also how you can leverage this technology in your own business. If you have an agency or a small business or large business enterprise as well, there's something here for everyone. Um, this is just a little bit more about my experience. Again, media relations, strategic uh, PR, crisis comm, online reputation management. And you can read some of the awards here that I am the recipient of. So, uh, we're going to go over the market forecast and the generative AI landscape. I'm going to give you specific examples and prompts that you can use. We're going to walk through different use cases in uh, your own agency work. We're going to look at a risk analysis, and then I have some closing remarks. One other disclaimer here, the information in this webinar is educational. For informational purposes only, nothing here is considered legal or uh, financial advice. Um, so what is the process of digital transformation? Let's talk about it. We're really entering the a, a new phase of creative agency work. One may argue that it is, the, in many respects, a, a new form of an industrial revolution, as big as big as possibly the printing press, um, or any, or even electricity, or any major change that we have seen in American or human history. And one of the things that I, I always tell entrepreneurs is that if you are not thinking of how to put yourself out of business with AI, you're thinking about the wrong thing. And while this sounds harsh, it's just the unfortunate reality. But fortunately for you, you're here today and this is awesome for you, right? And so I think if you are an entrepreneur, you are actually in the best possible position to take advantage of every opportunity in emerging tech right now with AI and ML, much, so, much more so than if you are, are glued to a business and you don't have the, the flexibility to sort of change, um, to change directions. If you're an entrepreneur, of course, you know, and I talked about this uh, with, with NASDAQ and the, the feature profile that we did, that the art of entrepreneurship is, is about the constant process of reinvention. And reinvention is not only about reinventing yourself, it's also about reinventing your service offering. What you offer to the market when you started 15 years ago may not be what the market needs today. And the best entrepreneurs fundamentally understand that and they're able to get over themselves and their own fear of adapting to change in the best interest of what that looks like for their customers. And what I mean by that is that we're, we're, we are very closely nearing a time where the agencies who refuse to adapt to this technology, not only are they hurting themselves, they will actually be in a position where they're hurting their customer because they will be spending so much time on manual work that really could be automated through machine learning and different AI uh, software that they're not going, those clients will not get the best of them and the time that they're paying for in terms of strategic deliverables and, and initiatives. So uh, quick uh, stat here from PitchBook, which is that venture capitalists have increased their investment in generative AI by 425% since 
since 2020 now to $2.1 billion. And you're going to start to see that this digital uh, arms race is on in the generative AI market. And uh, while some of these are hot and flashy right now, I think a lot of them will actually shortly disappear. Uh, one, one thing that's important for people to understand is that many of these tools are simply wrappers on the same underlying technology. So what that means is that those who can market and promote what they're doing will certainly rise to the top. But inevitably, that also means that there's an inherent amount of underlying risk with business models built on top of those same under underlying technologies, because if they lose API access or if if OpenAI, for example, changes something in their model where they cut someone off, then that will impact every single business that is built on top of it. So one of the key takeaways from today is that if you're thinking of entering this space or creating your own AI tool for your clients, you really have to be thinking about not just having a tool, but also what underlying engine are you building that tool off of? What does that training data look like? Do you own that data? Do you own the IP rights to that data? And how sustainable is that in the long run? Because while though it, even though it seems like there's a, a gold rush right now in this space, you really want to make sure that what you're offering is very specific to your niche and not something else that anyone can offer. And we're seeing that right now in the AI copywriting tool market. I've seen it for the past two years. I, I constantly buy all these tools I know. Um, and, and so when people say, by the way, what is your favorite AI tool? I always answer the tool that you use. I don't think there's a one size fits all approach for everyone. I think a lot of it comes down to preference. And uh, for example, is reinforcement learning a part of that experience in, in the tool? Is it actually really learning on what you want? Can, do you have the ability to train it? Do you feel like there's bias in that training data set? Like you have to really get in there and work with it almost like it's, you know, Plato or Clay or something and, and see what you like best. And the only way to do that is to actually test the tools for, for yourself. So on the right, you're going to see a really um, great graphic from Antler on the, the current state of the generative AI startup landscape. What's incredible about this is there's probably going to be like another hundred companies literally in a month on this. So it, it everything that you see in AI quickly becomes outdated extremely fast. In terms of the use case for agencies, here are some ways that agencies can leverage this technology. AI-powered media monitoring, AI-powered image generation like Midjourney, uh, AI or DALI, AI task automation and project management tools where you're going to start to see that instead of clunky templates, you have the ability now to, to build custom AI-generated um, like a knowledge base that will start to learn your company preferences and be able to answer what you're looking for within your own knowledge base, which is just incredible. Um, AI content audits, AI content optimization, AI social media post generation, uh, AI text generation, and AI sales and business intelligence, as well as AI powered analytics and automation. I will say every single thing that you see on this list are tools that our agency is powered by. So one of, I think the best things that we have done as an agency is that we saw this shift about two years ago. I always tell people the thing that got me into this area. Um, one was a client that I work with who is a leader in the space who had, I really feel like I gained such an amazing education from working with them um, in terms of natural language processing and um, content optimization and how AI powered that. And it got me thinking about this in a very different way. But two is because of my addiction to buying lifetime uh, deal tools on different uh, different sites where you could pay one price and, and buy these AI writing tools. And so I, I literally probably have hundreds of them at this point since they first came out. But um, that's how I got into all of this. So, so if it's on here, it's something I use. That's why I can talk about it. These are just a few uh, of the, the big companies in the generative AI landscape. I imagine that this is going to shift substantially. Uh, and also big news yesterday from Google looking to compete uh, as well in the AI market. And we're going to talk about what that means for the future of search. So in terms of the agency business model and how creative agencies will need to adapt, a few different things to consider. Uh, the creative agency of the future will one reimagine how PR is conducted. And what that means is that typically a lot of uh, firms like mine work on a retainer model. You agree to what that retainer is going to be. There's, there's add-ons, there's things that are not included in that, but typically uh, that contract has an agreed upon amount and that's amortized over the amount of the contract duration. AI is really taking that model and completely Flip it, turning it upside down, because what's happening now is that all of these new tools 
uh, really have to be built into the cost of that contract, or you have to figure out how you are, are going to use the tools for your clients. Obviously, that requires a separate package or a separate um, offering of that. So there are three different ways that I've, I've experienced that you can do that. One is going to be the end user subscription where that client is paying for this subscription. And then you figure out if there's going to be a, a add-on or how you want to uh, handle that transaction. Two is bundled access. Um, and three is tiered access. So we're we play is in the bundled access and tiered access. And, and that's really been, I think, one of our largest competitive advantages because clients, because of the, the rates that we have for all of these tools, when clients work with us, they're literally actually getting what would amount to thousands of dollars a month uh, of access to these tools. So that in itself becomes a huge advantage. Um, sometimes the the actual value of all of those tools that, that we're using on their account um, that can often, if they were paying for a monthly, it would be often possibly even more than the actual retainer that they can pay for services. And clients who value AI will value that and do value that. So that's, I think, a really important component of this discussion today. So accelerated advancement in AI and adoption. So on the left, it's like, here's where we are now, and then here's where we're headed. So the current agency model, many agencies are still not integrating AI systems. Agencies that don't do that are going to be seen as obsolete, outdated, inefficient, and irrelevant. The more clients start to understand and play around with these tools themselves, the conversation is going to be, have you used these tools? Are you using these tools for us? And if not, why are you not? And if you're using them, how does that actually change what we're what we're paying you for. So what we've done is actually we lead those discussions with our clients first so that they don't have to come to us and, and ask us that. And we do onboarding with them on chat GPT on all of these tools so that they know and that they're part of the experience. We bring them into it. So that way they're not hearing about it from someone else and, and they're part of the creative process and journey with us. So we're going to go from one to one, ideally to one to many. You're going to move from inherent friction in the process, as any creative who's on this call knows, the current model is filled with friction. There is a prime opportunity and a ripe opportunity for AI to completely disrupt that. Um, you're going to move from that process with inherent friction to an LLM, a large language model powered creative solution. You're going to go from manual process to automated process. So agencies that do integrate AI systems are going to have a, a significant competitive advantage if the time, money, efficiency savings is then passed on to the clients, which will result in more strategic work, which at the end of the day is what clients are paying you for anyway. They want the output, but they also want the, the strategic work. And the more you use AI tools for automation, the more time that they will get of yours for really high level strategy in that 360 picture. So some market predictions, personal market predictions here. I believe that AI will increase uh, productivity and creative output. Uh, two, demand will increase for AI uh, and PR prompt engineers. Now we're already seeing, um, for example, some, uh, I saw a job posting the other day for a prompt engineer and it was $250,000. I mean, we're talking about possible, <laughs> the equivalent of uh, uh, legal uh, salaries. Like the, this, there's a, a prime opportunity for growth right now if you get into the market as an entrepreneur. Um, and also that AI proficiency will become one of the most important skills in PR. And I think this one's really interesting because in general, as an industry, PRs are usually the last to adopt technology. They believe that they won't be impacted by any of this. They believe that they are above the machine. And soon they will learn that their belief is, is just wrong. Um, no one is above the, the machine. No one is above AI. And that doesn't mean that AI is better than you, but it means that you need to figure out how to collaborate with it and work within these systems so that the systems don't completely overrun and overtake your business. Because they will. Anyone who's playing around with these tools right now will, will, can see that from a mile away. So the question is, how can you learn to play nice with machine learning and AI and offer something where it doesn't completely displace you, but um, if you don't do that, it will replace you. So this is um, a graphic I made here for AI and, P AI and PR. You can see all the different ways our agency or your agency can, can use um, AI. One is these automated um, meeting agendas, or if you're doing a product launch, uh, go to market plan, SEO meta descriptions, PR pitch angles, uh, SEO natural language processing keyword list. 
press release drafts, brand positioning, logo identity creation, PR milestones for benchmarking and uh, uh, campaign uh, rap reports, investor memo drafts, um, OKR lists, and go-to-market wins. So these are just some uh, PR marketing and AI growth ideas from RMG as to how we actually currently use AI in our system. So the generative AI landscape, we're going to look here at three different buckets, resources, risk, and allocation. There are a few things you need to know. One is going to be learning the systems. Then it's also which systems you're going to choose. That in itself is a full-time job because there's just so many tools coming at you. And you need to understand every time you onboard with a new tool, it's more time and more money. It's not just the cost of the tool, it's the cost that is required for everyone in your organization to do that onboarding. So that's a service we offer where we, we will typically do that with clients. And the reason why is because it just will save everyone time and, and, and resources in the end because each of these tools takes so long to learn. It's also why I think one of the greatest value adds that an agency will have is that they're taking on that time themselves. And then that saving sort of just gets passed on to the client because the truth is as much as you think AI may replace you, clients don't want to sit here and learn all these different systems. They don't have time for it. They're interested in the output, not how you got there. And that's something that's important. And, you know, I had a conversation the other day with someone um, in the TV booking world. And they said, well, you know, is, is, is chat GPT going to book you as a guest on that show? And it's like, no, the chat GPT is not going to book me as a guest. They don't have the relationships that you have, but could chat GPT save you time drafting pitch angles? Yes. Could it save you time drafting or updating executive bios? Yes. So there's the best way to understand this is that it's not about um, replacing the entire part of the service offering. It's about replacing specific parts of the offering that could be uh, moderated to different processes and tools. And then you, of course, have to create a standard operating procedure for the new system once you have it in place. So reimagining the future of PR. Here are some ideas for you that, that you can use um, with a tool like ChatGPT or any other tool, by the way. Everyone's talking about uh, ChatGPT, but there are many. So I'm not glued here to ChatGPT. Use whatever tool you think is right for your business. Um, you can write a media list of the top reporters, write sound bites and talking points for a media interview, draft executive quotes for a press release, photo captions for a media advisory. You can write an executive apology for crisis comm PR, write PR pitch email subject lines, market research for a PR pitch or trend analysis, or a media briefing and press release draft. So really, PR's future is now. There's never been a better time for, for people in PR to really realize they're standing on the edge of a cliff and now it's now or never they have to make a decision that they are really going to uh, ad ad adapt and adopt the new technology so that their clients ultimately get the best results from this hybrid approach to PR with automation and a human in the loop. Um, so generative AI landscape in PR and marketing, um, the use of these tools has been revolutionized in recent years. Again, we're only at the tip of the iceberg. So whatever you see now, I feel like 10 years from now, we're going to be so much further along. Um, so the technology can identify patterns in data or language um, or images and then create content or contextual clues that will, that will be tailored to the needs of those audiences. Um, and so I call it the rise in artificial creativity. So Really, uh, what you need to think about is that it's like there are these tools, whether it's Notion or Obsidian, uh, they're called second brain tools. And that's the best way that I like to describe it to people, which is that it's if you are a solo on here, if you're a small business, if you don't have a bunch of AEs that work for you, I think there's real power in using AI because it's sort of like having all of this, you know, a team of creatives sitting around the table with you, giving you other ideas you may not have thought about. Now, that doesn't mean you have to use those ideas, but it can it can position you and put you in a whole other direction in terms of create creative output for where you're going with a client campaign. So let's reimagine the agency of the future. And we didn't enter, or I did an interview with Harvard uh, Business Review about this, I think a month or two ago. And even since then, it's just crazy how much things continue to change with AI. Um, so how can you today utilize AI to achieve your business outcomes? Um, one, accelerating the process and velocity of content production at scale. Two, unlocking new business opportunities. And then three, data-driven insights. So what does that mean? Uh, instead of just looking at your website and 
creating content, throwing it against a wall. You can really have creative intelligence that you're using with these AI powered tools to tell you, okay, well, let's benchmark this against every other topic, every other article that's trying to rank for this topic and see where you fit in that before you even write the article. And that's a perfect example, right? That's not displacing what you're doing, but it's, it's giving you, it's freeing up your time to actually do the article and in a way that makes sense. So you have a chance at winning. And so these tools can really help automate a lot of the tasks that you have to do and free up your time for strategic tasks. Here's a use case. So how, you know, someone said, how will AI change the way we write copy for clients? So I'm going to give you a real world example. Um, as anyone knows who is a creative, we are all notoriously known for being somewhat sensitive, myself included, when clients reject their creative work or campaign ideas. Uh, shout out in the chat or Q&A here, give that a like somewhere on Twitter or in the YouTube chat if you can relate to that or know what I, what I mean here. And so one, one area about generative AI that I absolutely love that I'm going to discuss today is that I think it's a great way to learn your client's preferences without having your work torn apart. And what that means is that the traditional way of me doing onboarding with a client would be for me to write an article about an, a topic that they want to rank on. But of course, the only way you really learn their preferences is by them sort of, one is the brief and how detailed and good that brief is, but two is how much they tear that part, that work apart. So one amazing workaround that I love and that you can adapt from this conversation is sit with the client, do a screen share like we're doing right now on Zoom with ChatGPT. Ask ChatGPT to write that article and then have the client tell you what they do not like about the article that ChatGPT wrote. And you are going to get a world-class education very fast about everything the client hates and it's not your writing. Instead, it's ChatGPT's writing. And then that's really gonna empower you as the content marketer to understand their preferences without having your work turn apart. And then when you actually turn around that first draft to them that you're writing without the assistance of AI, it's going to be much closer in alignment to what they like and what they don't like, because you're going to know that from doing that exercise. So um, the criticism, have them criticize chat GPT, take in that feedback. It's going to do wonders for the friction and that inherent process and the creative process and report back to me. If anyone actually tries this, I'd love to know uh, what you think about that. I think it's been a godsend and it's like my new favorite thing to do in the onboarding process. So um, let's evaluate AI here. There's domain expertise, the task that needs to be done, and then the business opportunity. And the benefits include automation, increased output at scale, and creative alignment. Creative alignment is really important, like we just talked about. And the same issues that come up in, in creative alignment uh, without AI tools will still come up again with them. And so that's that's important to consider. Um, on the right here, you will see the feature article that NASDAQ did about me on their website. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, if you have a chance to read it, please do read it if you can, because I shared a lot of uh, advice uh, for other entrepreneurs uh, about uh, my journey. So maybe that will help someone. But Here's one of the th things I said. Uh, if the United States does not have the right talent to win the AI war, we stand to lose our leadership position on the world stage as a global leader in AI, AI technology. So part of the thing that really drives me and why I've shifted my career in this area is because I truly believe this quote that I said, I really believe we're standing like we, we are standing in the middle of a very important decision right now. And what we do next will really determine the future, not only of the industry you're in, but in our country's uh, stance as a leader in this area. So the more you can do to lead in this area, the more you're actually, I think, helping the United States lead in AI, which is part of the reason why I've tried to assume a leadership role in this area and really educate other people about how they can use these tools in their business. Uh, because we really stand to lose everything if we fall behind in that area. So the, the more we can innovate, the more it helps everyone. Um, so let's look at examples of strategies and prompts. Um, this idea, I think this one I may have seen um, somewhere. I thought it was a great idea. So the idea is that you can, that chat GPT can serve as a surrogate journalist for media training. So again, media training, executive media training is a service that Ruby Media Group offers, but chat GPT sort of throws a wrench in it. Um, because typically, like we have to manually come up with um, pretending to be that journalist and coming up with the tough questions and then, you know, recording that on camera with a client to try and um, train them for every worst case scenario, every possible, every really difficult question. 
But chat GBT can be used in that crisis comm media training work now um, to help you with that. So one is that you can ask it to write a reactive statement from an executive. Uh, for example, with OpenAI, I show you how that looks. Um, obviously, you should always edit everything that it gives you. Never, never actually use any of this stuff as is. Um, that's like rule number one with all of this. I think I think people who use this as is are really just gonna like really hurt their search engine ranking results over time. And they're also gonna hurt their thought leadership on a global scale because if you have a following, people follow you for a reason. They're following they're following your opinions on something. And I think that's something that really chat GPT or any of these tools definitely lacks in that overall thought leadership area there's one thing to give a fact and even a lot of the facts are outdated depending on the cutoff uh data when it was trained or so um i think that's we could probably do a whole other webinar about that but that's something to consider um and then you can give it prompts for the tone i also uh use chat gbt i tell it if i'm doing a twitter space on um, machine learning and AI. I say write 10 interview questions on machine learning and AI and the role uh, in uh, social media censorship. And I look at those questions and let's say like three questions are good and then I'll rewrite the other seven and then boom, like that will be used to guide the entire conversation. That just saved me two hours of time. So it's like all of those things. Um, I think that e even if the public doesn't see it, if you can just use it to guide discussions or conversations or podcast interviews, that will certainly save you a lot of time. Um, and then you can integrate some of those answers into the briefing. One of my favorite things to do is actually almost to correct the output. So I can ask this, I could look at the output and as a subject matter expert, like I will just go to town in terms of rewriting almost everything it says, um, because I can clearly see what's wrong, what's outdated, what's repetitive, when it's hallucinating, which means it's sort of making up facts that don't exist. And so, um, it just, it gives you a starting point. But that starting point should not be the same as where your ending point, basically. For PR prompt ideas, you could tell it to write 10 social media posts about X, suggest a PR plan for X. What are 10 types of uh, companies a business and X should partner with for X activation? Uh, write a PR report summarizing press coverage on X. Write a PR pitch for uh, X expert. Write a media advisory, create a media list. What are the top 10 tech reporters who write about AI or the top 10 podcast about cardiology? Now, these last two things or last three things, those are all things that an AI would do for me that, that will take, you know, hours, if not days of time. So this can speed up the process. And now I'm going to show you some examples. Here's an example of an image I created on MidJourney that uh, even if I don't end up using this image for something, I can use it for a, a mood board, I can use this for, let's say I'm thinking about rebranding. This is this can be used so I can see, okay, this is what that rebrand or refresh would look like with this other color scheme in this other direction. Is it something I wanna go with yes or no? One of the things I like to say is that you don't always have to use everything you generate. Like what you generate will get you closer to what you like and further away from what you don't like. And so I think that can be really helpful. Here are all examples of um, images that I have created using MidJourney. I pay for that tool every month. Um, and even if I don't use all of them or haven't used them, I save them the same way. Traditionally, you know, before you'd go to something like Unsplash and you would save up this image database. Uh, now I don't go to Unsplash. I make my own images and that way I have them saved for art myself and also for clients uh, based on what they want um, and the prompts they want for their blog posts. These images can be used for social media graphics, for uh, blog posts, header images, you name it. This is an example. Um, when you're on a roll, uh, with MidJourney and you love what you get and you keep re-rendering, this is an example of what that looks like. So here's a Pixar style Chihuahua, uh, studious Chihuahua with glasses that I really liked. And so you can start to see the process of re-rendering it. I haven't I haven't decided on my favorite yet. I haven't even decided on where I'm using these images, but I like, have, I like knowing that I have the images for when I do need them. Um, and so I think that's something to consider as well. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you're asked to uh, a gala or a black tie event, the worst time to get a dress for that event is going to be like 24 hours before. The best time is like before you're ever even asked, a few months before so that you have everything, you have a dress saved if you need it. That's how I look at this. Like I'm not making these images because I, I have a need tomorrow. The need is for the future. I don't know what that need will be, but at least I'm prepared. So here's an example of uh, using ChatGPT for headline generation. Um, I one, one of the beats I write about is AI marketing and PR. And so you can see um, after I finish writing an article, 
um, I'll actually look at these ideas and I'll think, oh, it's like, is their headline stronger? Could that be used in a meta description? I don't actually use the output for what I'm writing, but I do think that it can be helpful to see like, oh, can I make this uh, header tag stronger, this H2 stronger in my article on WordPress, anything like that, I think it's useful for. Um, and then um, let's look at pitch angles. Oh, this is for a media list, very important. What was, so normally... <laughs> Traditional agencies would pay for Cision, um, which is um, the media database. So I asked it to play around here. What are the top technology reporters who write about AI? So here you have a full list of um, tech reporters. Whether these are the top tech reporters or not, I don't know that they are. They, they may not be. That's not even the point. The point is that it, it was actually able to save me a lot of time. And I was shocked to see that it gave me full email addresses, which I um, removed from here. But even if, let's just say um, seven of these are wrong, outdated, useless, even if one is right, that's just saving an hour of time and research. So that's the way that I look at it. Like, I'm not looking at this like this is going to be a full, uh, exhaustive media list. But if I just get one name that's right, then that's going to save me time and research later on. So now let's look at an example. By the way, this is fictitious. OpenAI did not write this. This is not a real letter from OpenAI. I used ChatGPT to write this. Uh, fake apology from OpenAI, to be clear, for a, dis a legal disclaimer. Um, so I wrote, OpenAI has recently been accused of bias in machine learning trading data set. Write an apology to the public from the founder. Let people know what steps you're going to take. Super specific. And here, you, like, this is a good first draft. That's how I see it. Am I going to use this and go out to the public if this was my client? With what OpenAI, with what they've written here? No, because it still needs to be my own work. But... This first draft will give me a, sort of a, a skeleton or a framework for where I need to go with all of this. And then I'll start my the start the writing from there. Again, that saves me staring at a blank piece of paper to actually getting something and then rewriting that. So that's how I see that being useful. Next, I said, what are a list of the top 10 podcasts on artificial intelligence and machine learning? based on their largest reach and audience size. I have no idea, to be clear, if this is correct. I see that there are some very big podcasts in AI that aren't even on here. So right off the bat, like I know my PR Spidey Sense is saying like, this isn't all correct. Maybe none of it is. But the point is, I actually didn't know about any of these. Um, so like, maybe it's good to know. I also think that I see... Um, it, sometimes it's repetitive. Sometimes it gives you the same answer over and over again, or um, even a broken link. Um, so that's important to look through as well. And I just think, you know, I don't think you should be looking at this like, oh, this is going to completely replace um, the research required to get this list of top podcasts, but it it can give you some podcasts maybe you've never heard of. That's So that's a better way to look at it. Now let's talk about uh, TV booking and writing a PR pitch. Go, going back to the earlier example here, I said, write a PR pitch about Chris Ruby to a TV producer. She can speak on her reporting work on the Ruby files and how Twitter used natural language processing and the role this has in the future of social media content moderation. Very specific. Include my bio and talking points to pitch the producer. Now, again, by the way, the talking points are always going to have to be rewritten. The talking points have to be what the client says or what I'm saying, not you know what, what this is saying. Um, but this is just going to give you bullets uh, to which you can rewrite. And so you can see the pitch. There are some things that stand out to me. Like I wouldn't say, I hope this email finds you well. I would address this to someone I know. Um, this entire first um, paragraph, probably like, it's all probably too long. My pitch would probably be half the size of this. Um, I this The public speaker part, I wouldn't include in there. Um, CNN isn't correct. Um, I don't see where the talking points are. It, it needs to be bulleted, formatted, and shaped differently. It's missing a picture of me. It's missing a video link, and it's missing my location. I know that all I can because of my training as a practitioner. And so this is where someone who thinks that this is can replace a PR firm is actually truly misguided because it can't. And I'm walking you through exactly why it can't because I know that uh, as a producer, like this, will, where this is going to end up. But as a practitioner, I also know how to rewrite it to make it better. So here you can see an example where I tell with the reinforcement learning, no, she didn't appear on CNN, include the actual name of her work with the hashtag. She lives in New York, so put that location in. We don't want the part about public speaking, so remove it. Uh, and this would be for a live and studio TV interview. Now, what's fascinating is when you re-render this output, you can actually see it's learning. It made all the changes I wanted. It's still not right. 
and I, I still wouldn't use this, but it's better than where we started. Um, and it doesn't know, by the way, can't know what my talking points are. These are not my talking points. I'd have to actually manually put in my talking points. The talking points should be an opinion. There's no way that it can know what my opinion is. So some stuff has to be replaced with, with manual uh, input. And so this is where I think the greatest opportunity is. Like for someone like myself, if I were to create my own, which is actually something I'm working on, but if I were to create um, my own niche uh, oriented uh, AI tool in this space, it would be programmed based on all of the pitches I have. And I, if you get enough of those, then you can ideally create a neural network that's trained on that so that each time this output is closer to, to a pitch I would actually use. Um, so now let's quickly move to how AI, AI will change search. And let me just look at the time. I want to make sure I'm not going, oh, okay. Um, in the future, the way we interact with search is going to change drastically. Uh, we're going to see the shift uh, from search engine to an answer engine. You can already see this on you.com, which is quickly becoming one of my new favorite uh, search engines. So I've been playing around with that tool for, I think, about a year, and they just keep coming out with really new, great new features. Uh, recently, they launched this built-in AI chat integration. I think that will serve as a replacement for search queries. So instead of going to something like chat, OpenAI and ChatGBT, this interface actually has a built-in to, to the search engine directly. So it saves you that step. Uh, of logging in or going to uh, the platform. Um, I am a firm believer, I've been saying this for two years, your rankings could drop if Google penalizes AI generated content. I feel like their stance on this continues to change daily. And now we know that they're also trying to get in the game. We don't know what's happening with um, what the uh, underlying watermark of uh, AI generated content in general. I think just using content um, that AI can generate isn't really a best practice for real content marketers or, or journalists. And the reason I say that is because it's inherently not in alignment with the, the fundamentals of Google's uh, quality rater guidelines for EAT, expertise, authority, trustworthiness. EIT hasn't changed with AI. That's really important for people to understand. So even though you can create all this content, are you still exhibiting expertise, authority, and trustworthiness? Or are you actually exhibiting the opposite of trustworthiness and making yourself more untrustworthy as a thought leader by just generating co content that literally anyone could write? If anyone else can write it, you're actually not creating information gain. You're not making the internet better. You're doing the total opposite. And over time, I, it is my opinion that that will actually hurt EAT for the thought leader that's doing that. So that's not something I recommend um, at all. So I think that's a really important component of this. When I'm creating an article, my goal is always, can I create the best piece of content on the internet on, on this topic, the most exhaustive? So typically anything that I create, it's something I'm working on for a few months. Uh, it's usually a 45 minute read. My most recent article on um, Twitter and natural language processing is about 30,000 words. Um, some people will say that's too long. Some people will say that should be in five different uh, articles. And you know, SEOs can argue about that component of it, but I like to work on evergreen topics and then build on, on those topics and continue to update them over time. So that, that, I, that I'm creating something that really does help people who wanna understand. And the difference is that if you actually go to ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT, Chat, GPT to write an article about how Twitter used natural language processing, it's never going to write the article I did. Why? Because there's no journalism in it. So my prediction, and I talk about this in, in the, the NASDAQ uh, article that I did with them, is that the skill, the core tenets of journalism are going to be your greatest competitive advantage. Because the thing, what is not in that, that underlining um, data set? What was not used in training? What, what facts can you find out? What stories do you have? that no one else can generate in, a, in an AI model. I think that's how you're gonna win in, in this new creator economy uh, driven by AI. Um, also, I think you're gonna see an increase in DMCA takedown notices for article spinning. I've already had to start sending more out again because people are just straight up ripping off my content and it's plagiarized content. I mean, I, that was already happening before, but now it's it's happening uh, at you know times 10 and I recognize it. And I, you'll start to see, and this is gonna be a whole other issue with all of this that like, you know, my my work on cancel culture, if I asked um, ChatGPT or these tools to write about cancel culture, what it regurgitates back to me is reminiscent of my work, right? So the same way that artists are not happy that their work was used in underlining data sets for training, writers are also not happy about that, which is something that no one really talks about, but is, is very important. So people are going to, the future, I think, is going to be if 
writers and artists have the ability to opt out because this this sort of creates tons of problems, right? Like, do I want to spend the time writing the best piece, the best piece of content of 30,000 words on the internet if that can be used to train and then anyone can take that, basically lift my work and have the same content? Like, what is the value add there? It, that's going to hurt a lot of people wanting to publish their stuff in, in, in a way that it can be used to train. So this is really something that I think a lot of SEOs and, and content marketers and journalists are, are thinking through right now. Um, another change here, at least with you, is you can sort of start to see that Google, um, or at least you, will show sources in the AI-generated answers drawn from the knowledge gap. And this is an example. I love this AI-driven search engine, and here's why. When I ask you chat, I say, what are the Ruby files on Twitter by Kristen Ruby? It actually knows it. It can it can accurately answer this because it's pulling from LinkedIn. It's pulling from my Twitter, um, and it, it's it's giving answers and citing and sourcing that data. If I ask Google, "What are the Ruby files on Twitter?" by Kristen Ruby, it does not give me this answer. It feels like it's lagging behind with even understanding what it is. It may pull up my article on it, but it doesn't have an answer like this. So this, to me, is going to be the future of search because it's actually really just answering the question in a way that, that search engines aren't right now. Um, another SEO hack that I'll, I'll use after I've written an article is I'll say, give me, a, here, give me a list. What is a list of the top natural language processing terms related to Twitter machine learning? So again, I do most of this after I've already written the article, which is totally different than the way most people use it, but I think it's a good way to use it. So as I go through this, I start to think, okay, like number five, I didn't use that. Topic modeling, maybe I need to write more about that. Segmentation, not sure I use that language. Like I can start to see, like I know I use Word to Vec. I remember that being part of it, SVM. Um, everything here with ML algorithms was used. Neural networks, could, I could probably go into a little bit more. Same with deep learning. Did not use a natural language understanding. Um, not sure if I use natural language generation. Twitter API, I should probably update that. So the process you just saw me do is literally the exact process I do in my workflow. And then I'll go and rewrite and edit and add to my work. So I'm constantly doing that when I when I use it in that way. Um, and so I think that generative AI and PR firms, the future is really going to be automation. Um, and as I stated earlier, we're on the brink of a revolution, and this will transform the way firms create and deliver content. Now, a lot of PR firms still don't even do this. Like if you ask, if you ask a TV booking firm, they don't create content. They write pitches, but they don't even do a lot of the things that we're mentioning. And I I think that the the days of getting away with that are going to be uh, coming to a screeching halt soon when they're forced to start really offering more services um, than what they currently offer. And so this is another example here for research automation, where you can see um, I'm. this would normally take me three hours of work, but I put in, okay, I'm writing an article on AI, natural language processing. Now, some of this is irrelevant, right? I Obviously, I don't care about these. I can see what's wrong. So I'm not looking at all the stuff that's wrong. But I can see, I see predictive data analysis, natural, like I can start to see what I would need out of here for H2 tags or H3, and then I'll put that in a Word document. So it's not that I'm using this to write, it's that it will structure what I'm writing, right? There's a fundamental difference in those two things. I think the people that use this the right way strategically use it in the way I just mentioned. The people who aren't use it to write the articles. And I, I think that's a mistake. Um, automated content generation, you can see, again, this is another tool where it's telling me, okay, here are the important natural language processing phrases that you should be using in this article. What's interesting here is I'm doing all of this after the article is written, like PR professionals don't matter, Waze AI, I don't care about that. Um, but you can, sentiment analysis, I'm like, hmm, did I really thoroughly cover the topic of sentiment analysis or even image recognition? Not sure. Like that tells me maybe I need to go back and add another paragraph on that and update the article so people understand that. The reason you're doing that is so that you can help someone see the entire word cloud, the entire cluster and entities that are related to this topic, which is really at the core of what NLP entity mapping is. Um, AI powered content creation. Again, we use this um, in our agency with clients for automated content briefs. AI content optimization, and then AI generated content outlines. So our entire workflow is different. You, you, like it's hard to explain, but every, like we used to do all of this in a manual way that's now been replaced with these AI tools that our clients like, love, and come to expect from us at this point. I don't think they'd want to go back to the other way because it also takes more of their time back and forth. Um, and these AI content briefs 
also they love them because it gives them an idea of a lot of different topics like we just looked at that they may not have even thought about that need to be incorporated into what they're writing when when we're collaborating on this. Um, another example, right? If I if I say with a content tool like give me, I want to know who's ranking for this and uh, you know, how are you scoring it? You can see here and I start to look at like, okay, well, obviously like this this one with 157 words isn't uh, ranking, but we knew that without AI or NLP, but it's just doing all of this. It's like, okay, that's almost like, this gives me a better idea. It guides where I'm going with it to give a competitive advantage. So here's a quick checklist. Do you own the data IP of the, the creation? Yes or no? Did you run it through a plagiarism checker? Always do that with any AI output. Did you disclose the content when it's AI generated? You need to do that. The FTC is clear on this and they will continue to come out with uh, legislation in the near future about the rules and parameters for this. But this disclosure, by the way, is not only about um, on the article itself. You must disclose to your client if you're using AI tools and how you're using them. Because if you don't, uh, you can be putting them in a position um, for a takedown notice or for underlying legal issues with how that content's be, being created. Um, you also, of course, want to update your terms of service on your site, as well as for your contracts to let clients know uh, the AI tools that you use to make automated decisions. The FTC is very clear about that as well. So you want to make sure you're following those guidelines. If you're using any of these tools to make automated decisions or to optimize or update or prune, or however you want to phrase it, you need to let people know. Um, and I, I would go one step further and actually do that not only at that core site level, but also in the individual article level. Did you check the information to make sure it's factually correct? Again, a lot of it won't be. And so you, you, sometimes AI takes actually more time than it's even wor worth, to be honest, because of this process of having to go back and, and recheck everything if, if half of it's wrong. So that's just something to think about as well. So some mistakes to avoid, don't use AI to write thought leadership content. Um, thought leaders are leaders because people follow what they say. So you don't want to be a thought follower. You want to be a thought leader. Um, don't use it to craft source quotes for reporters or pitches on Harrow. That's a great way to get your stores, your client banned forever uh, because you don't realize, like you don't know if you're giving a quote that's actually plagiarized. So that's just really not, don't do that. And I've spoken with journalists at national outlets who who reiterate that they definitely would like never work with someone again if a PR firm gave them a quote that was generated by AI. So um, they also have specific ethical guidelines they have to follow. So you want to make sure you're following them. Um, don't use other artist styles. I know this is very popular to do that when you're making images on Midjourney, but um, I think that you should try and create your own style and then work off of that. Um, again, personal choice, preference, ethical decisions, but your company certainly needs to create an AI um, ethics um, document where you let people know where you stand on that. Um, if you see an image um, that has watermarkings on it from another artist, I say start over and don't use it, or at least that's what I do. You want to watch out for bad output. A lot of output can be totally off brand and it's fun and it's cool and it's hip but it can actually irritate your clients. If you keep giving them renders of things that have nothing to do with the creative brief, they're going to start to wonder if you know what you're doing or why they hired you. So I think that's one of the concerns with this emerging tech that on the one hand, it's incredible <laughs> that you can get all of these um, different outputs, but it can also be overwhelming to someone and they still want things that are that remain on brand for them. And that's, I think, a core challenge with it. Um, expect to re-render many times. Uh, expect that there's going to be outdated content and incorrect facts. Also, know when you're using a bad prompt. Um, bad input leads to bad output. Um, repetitive output is also um, just sort of garbage uh, copy. So just because it gives you copy doesn't mean you should use the copy. Obviously, your role as a copywriter or an agency owner or an executive is that like you can spot good copy from bad copy. So that part hasn't changed. It all goes back to the strategy. And then watch out for hallucinations in the output. So that's when it just starts giving off facts that aren't real. And then here's the risk analysis and issues. You want to look at privacy, plagiarism, and training data. Um, there are certain risks of participating in these ecosystems. There's currently unclear legislation. Um, there are increased legal fees to uh, update those contracts, to have your lawyer, lawyer review uh, all of these areas we're talking about, um, the cost for software, and then the implementation of that software, the uh, learning curve, the increased uh, cost for um, the, the bundling that we talked about, uh, the software, um, and then 
But the main thing you want to think about is what is the cost of getting left behind? You know, what, what does that cost you? How do you look at the price of that, of getting left behind versus the price of the implementation? Ultimately, that's what it all goes back to. Um, you don't want to mislead your audience about AI involvement. Um, and AI, um, OpenAI says that you have to indicate that the content is AI generated in a way that no user could reasonably miss or misunderstand. That's This is directly from their site. Uh, additionally, there's these trademark and copyright and IP issues, um, the ownership. This ownership IP transfer, I could do an entire slide, a deck and presentation on that. This is going to be a problem for agencies. I can see the writing is on the wall with this. There's already issues, inherent issues with the IP transfer uh, when you transition at the end of an engagement and you hand off those files to uh, uh, the uh, another agency or to the client directly. This is going to make all of that that much more confusing when you add in this software stack, when you add in uh, who actually owns the output. Is it, and who's liable for it? Is it you? Is it the agency? Is it the is it the client? Is it the the model? Right, there are so many new questions to consider, and that's where I think legal has to really be involved in that, and you have to be, get clear on that. Um, and so to recap, uh, I believe that the future in terms of skill upscaling, knowledge of generative AI tools is one, but also being a good um, prompt engineer is going to be another, and and most importantly, the ability to quickly adapt to new AI technology as it emerges. So you should hire PR. Uh, legal counsel, developers, and engineers, if you want to make your own AI, and then an AI consultant um, like us, where we can work with you on the, the implementation and the ideation. And listen, you may also come away from that saying, you know, it's not right for us at this time because of the cost or because we don't have anyone to work with you to actually execute what you're proposing, which is which is a reasonable output from that discussion as well. Um, and you, you need to make sure you have those internal capabilities for onboarding if you do bring on an agency to, to do this. If not, it's gonna be a, a total waste of resources. Um, and so participation in an emerging ecosystem comes with inherent risks. Are you prepared for those risks? Um, generative AI is going to have a significant impact on every creative industry. Everyone is trying to figure out how we're going to adapt right now um, to the next industrial revolution. So what you have to think about is what is the problem you're really trying to solve and why is it important to your business? AI has to be aligned with your business objectives. Uh, the innovation and next-gen solutions will show your, your clients who can adapt to change and you're ready to tackle the most challenging problems of, of our country and our, our nation. An inability to do this ultimately means that your clients may suffer in the process from an outdated creative agency approach and the systems that are required for manual input. In the future, we will move away from this. All of this will be seen as, as really antiquated and we're not that far off from that future. To conclude, I cover all things AI marketing, PR, and social media. Please do go to rubymediagroup.com, which is my agency's website. You can see uh, our guide on hiring an AI uh, marketing agency. You can see a primer on artificial intelligence as well as many other articles which are listed here. My most recent article is about artificial intelligence on Twitter. You can also read uh, a rundown on AI marketing in the top GPT-3 and AI writing PR tools as well as a CMO's guide to AI and marketing. Uh, we would love for you uh, to reach out if you're interested in working with us for any enterprise uh, client consulting engagements. Again, on the left, you can see the services we offer include brand, personal branding, PR consulting, media relations, content marketing, social media, and thought leadership. If you want to know our tech stack and what tools we use to run our agency, here is our, our digital store uh, on uh, shopper.com, I believe, where you can see we frequently update this uh, list of tools that we like and recommend anything on here is actually tools that we pay for and use. We don't include anything that we don't pay for or don't use for our clients. Um, and in closing, you will gain exclusive access to AI software, end-to-end -end AI solutions, automated briefs, uh, NLP and SEO, AI supported crisis come, no code AI. So really we think of problems before you do. And we, our goal is to help you and aid you in the process of digital transformation. So I want to thank NASDAQ and everyone involved for inviting me to present today. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions right now, uh, if you have any, and you can, of course, oh, it's, it's 301 right on time. You can reach me on Twitter at Ruby Media Group for ongoing discussion. Thank you.
Thank you so, so much, Chris. That was absolutely amazing. Um, we are out of time. Unfortunately, I know we have a lot of questions, but if you could just give one key takeaway to the audience that you want them to walk away with, what would that be? Um, sorry, one. if I could give one key takeaway to the audience, I, I guess it would be don't be afraid to learn. I think, I think um, people are so afraid that AI can be really overwhelming. Um, but once you like really get into it and just learn one tool, then you're going to want to learn another and it doesn't have to be so scary. And if, if you do learn it and you're like, Hey, this is, I don't want to use any of it. That's okay too. Yeah. I just really encourage people to like, keep an open mind to constantly be open to reinvention. Because I think the one thing that kills most entrepreneurs is, is when the, they close off their mind to learning. Love it. Amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Please feel free to connect with Chris if you didn't have your question answered. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'd love for you to join us for our upcoming webinars. You can view them in the link that's gonna be posted in the chat. Chris, thank you again so much on behalf of the entire NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance today. We're so, so grateful for you uh, to join us. And thank you again, everyone, for joining mm -hmm. us. We look forward to welcoming you back online with us soon. Thank you. Have a great day.